and I'm going to turn this over to David. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is David Ware with the Arkansas State Archives, and I forgot to put down my hand when they asked for a moderator for this session. This is a fascinating session for me um, because I had had I had no actual experience with replevin. I wanted to know more about it. And also the fact that replevin is a middle French word excites my daughter, the linguist, um, amazingly. It doesn't take much to get linguists excited, apparently. But um, my main job is to introduce our speakers, um, give a little intro to the session, and then um, assist with the fielding of questions after the presentations are done. And so I'll start by uh, giving a bit of an introduction to our speakers. Uh, we have our first two, Jeff Landau and Mitch Yokelson. Jeff Landau has been with NARA, National Archives and Records Administration, since 1995, and in the Office of General Counsel since 1997. He has a JD from Fordham University in New York, home of one of the best college radio stations on earth, and an MA in American History from the American University of Washington, DC. Mitch has been with NARA since 1988. He started as a reference archivist specializing in military records. Then in 2006, he joined the NARA Office of Inspector General as an investigative archivist and now leads the Archival Recovery Program. Now, in addition to these emissaries from the mothership, we have um, two eminent state archivists, Jelaine Chubb. Jelaine joined the Texas State Library and Archives Commission in June 2010 as Director of the Archives and Information Services Division and Texas State Archivist. Under her guidance, the agency has greatly expanded its digitization efforts and has created an online portal, the Texas Digital Archive, that currently boasts more than 7 million records and is a model to its poor relation cousins over in Arkansas. Jelaine came to Austin after serving as State Archivist of Ohio. She previously held positions with South Carolina and with the Kansas State Historical Society and the Missouri State Archives. She is a native of South Carolina. She earned her bachelor's degree in history and political science from the College of Charleston, master's degrees in library and information science and applied history with a specialization in archival administration, both from the University of South Carolina at Columbia. She is a certified archivist and a certified records manager. She's a fellow of the Society of American Archivists. We also have on the program today, Kate O'Brien. Kate currently serves as Maine's state archivist overseeing Maine state government's archives and records management programs. As a curator of the award-winning exhibition, Malaga Island, Fragmented Lives, Kate is also an historian for the Malaga Island community. She previously held positions as chief curator and director of public engagement at the Maine Historical Society and as the curator of historic collections for the Maine State Museum. Also scheduled, but of, alas uh, for Family Considerations not appearing today is Joe Klett, who has worked at the New, New Jersey State Archives for, pardon me, New Jersey State Archives for 40 years, first as a processing assistant, then a, while an undergraduate, then as collections manager from 1989 to 2000, then as chief of operations till 2012, at which time he was appointed executive director. Over the course of his career, he has been directly involved in nearly 100 public record recovery cases for the state of New Jersey, ranging from single manuscripts to caches of government documents that somehow went astray. I'm sorry we won't be hearing from Joe, hopefully another time. But at any rate, it's time for me to get out of the way and make room for our esteemed presenters. And so- David, be David before that, could uh -oh. we have a word from Meg and Joy? Oh, our, you, uh... you, should have, you, you, should have, you should have interrupted me sooner. <laughs> Um, thank you very much for creating space here. Um, I'm Meg Phillips. I'm the external affairs liaison for the National Archives and Records Administration. And I really welcome the chance to say hello to those of you who I haven't met yet. Um, this is one of the ways that NARA and state archives have a chance to meet each other's staff and, and figure out how similar programs work at the federal and state local uh, federal and state levels. So we really appreciate this chance to learn from state archives and to share what we're doing here at NARA. So thank you for the opportunity. Thanks, Meg. And I am Joy Banks. I 
join Meg's welcome to everybody. I serve as the executive director for the Council of State Archivists and and now I've I've been with COSA for just about a year, and I have to say I'm really excited about the presentation today because Replevin was definitely one of the things that was completely new to me joining this space. Uh, so I'm really excited that this is on our agenda, and we're so glad to see so many of you here today to learn along with us. So I'm so thankful to all of our speakers who have taken the time to share your stories, and I hope that um, together we learn quite a lot. So back to you, Dave. Okay. First off, my apologies to both Meg and Joy for jumping the gun there. I will blame the doctors with whom I spent an educational morning today already. At any rate, our speakers are up to bat um, to discuss something that is probably going to touch on just about any one of us at some point or another. Uh, depending upon your state laws, state laws about replevin vary considerably. Um, I'm just in the process of discovering our own right now. So I'm, I'm here to learn. So over to you, Jeff and Mitch. All right. Well, thank you all very much. Thanks for in, inviting us um, during our, our part of the session. Uh, one of the things that we want to stress is that Jeff and I and, and Nara as an agency does not take the issue of replevin light. In other words, when we consider an item that we've been made aware of that um, seems as though it's federal, um, we consider this, we talk it over, we share information with our subject area specialists and with our management before even taking some crucial steps and uh, if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, so what we um, as an agency have come up with in this five criteria are not set in stone, but they're really good guidance for Jeff and I. And, and, I, and I will say that, that Jeff and I work really well together coming from um, different backgrounds, Jeff being an attorney, but also with a strong history background and myself as um, an archivist and a historian. And Jeff does a great job of kind of, you know, keeping me um, under wraps and not getting too excited about something. But we always fall back on the questions of, was the document previously in the custody of NARA or one of our affiliated archives? And then, um, um, if the item was not part of NARA or an affiliate, in other words, not stolen, is, is the document something that um, we should consider? And then using the other three, does it fit into one of the series of records? Is it going to fit in neatly? The last thing that we want to do, and certainly our management makes this clear, is we don't want to turn NARA into a junk shop. We don't just want to go out and grab things. And um, did maybe the documents that they leave under some custody, government custody under some authority or proper instructions? Often we just don't know. And then lastly, which um, sometimes plays into whether or not we decide to um, at least make initial steps is, does the document have some such high intrinsic value that justifies recovery. And in some cases we deal with issues um, whether or not it's going to be a donation. And I think Jeff has good sort of terminology in, in delineating between what is something that we want to recover through Plevin and what is something that we want to recover through donation. Yeah, because you, you can look at, at the fundamental idea that, well, if you think it was a record, if you think it was government property, whether you look to the Constitution or whether you look to NARA statute, you can find the you can find the the authority for us to go and recover something. But but we don't, as as Mitch was saying, we don't want to get everything. We don't go out of our way if if a, if a a private citizen, a business, has their hands on something that arguably is federal. Federal, arguably, uh, we may not know exactly how it, it left the government's um, care. We may not know how the person wound up with it. So you, you really have to look at all those factors. 
and decide, is it worth it? Because uh, from a very, very practical standpoint, if somebody decides that they are not going to work with the National Archives, and if we decide that we really feel very strongly that an item should be with the National Archives, it's gonna wind up in court. And we're gonna to have to convince the Department of Justice to represent us. And the Department of Justice uh, is rather busy and they also don't want to be going after every document that may have left the government's care. So we, we have to use those, those five criteria. You know, Just how important is this? Are we sure it was a federal record? Was it ever in the custody of NARA? You can, you can imagine the kind of balancing that goes, that goes through our minds. You know, if, if we are sure that something has been stolen, if we know that something was in the custody of the National Archives from the time the National Archives started, which is 1934, we're going to be we're going to be more interested in, in going after that document than if it is older and if it is less clear that it was ever with the government and if it's less clear of the continuing value that the document has. And uh, just to add to a few things, which I think um, probably is similar to what our colleagues in the state archives deal with is and we're often asked that question in, in terms of what exactly do you go after? And, and I've had a number of um, volunteers and some interns work with me with the archival recovery program. And it's really difficult when I say, okay, we'd like you to search on eBay or one of the auction houses like Heritage or Sotheby's or Swans, and look for items that look like, that may seem to be federal, but there's such a gray area in determining. And it even gets, more cloudy, so to speak, when you involve the presidential libraries, because they have not only records, say, created by the president, but they also maintain personal letters, personal collections. Um, you know, an, an example um, is that some of Ronald Reagan's personnel uh, records came up uh, for sale uh, pertaining to when he worked with the military during World War II. And, you know, it, it was trying to figure out, okay, are these things that belong um, to us? And, and the, the other point is that, that perhaps other archivists encounter is, I often go to collector shows where people sell and buy historical items, largely military, but there are also uh, civilian type records. And I started going when I was with the inspector general's office and we would set up a table at these shows and the immediate reaction was, oh God, here's the federal government here. We're gonna have another Waco or Ruby Ridge incident and they're coming after and they're gonna take all of our stuff. And that was not the case. The idea uh, initially was to be more of an outreach to tell the collectors, dealers and those folks that, hey, we're out there. We're not gonna grab things. As Jeff said, we, we we think this over, we look at all of the criteria, we look at the, the items themselves. If there's something that really stands out, we're gonna at least take the initial steps. And by doing that outreach, it really helped. Because I can tell you that since the initial shutdown in March of 2020 and continuing today, um, we receive numerous inquiries, whether they're from other NARA uh, colleagues, or their patrons of the National Archives, or just collectors who see things for sale, for example, on eBay. And they look like federal documents, and in most cases they are, but sometimes they just don't fit into one of these five criteria. We thank the people who send us this, but generally we don't go after them. I and mean, how many items a year would you say that we seriously consider? I would say we seriously consider you know, probably two to five. Yeah. And I don't, and we, I don't think we've ever gone after in one year, five documents. No, but in the um, next slide, please, we'd like to show you um, some sample or examples of some items that we have gone after. Can, can, can I just, just interrupt just for one second? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. I'll, I'll give you an example really quick of, of something that we did go out to recover and it was worked out very, very nicely and um, with great cooperation. It's not quite to the level of what Mitch is gonna talk about in a second. It was a fort in Alaska 
and uh, they had logbooks for each year, you know, 19, 1890 through let's say 1920. And one of them was missing and one of the, and we'd have all of them, but one of them was missing and it was found somewhere. So when it came to our attention, we could find that it was clear that this set should have been or was entirely with us. So because that one was missing, although one could argue about the relative value of one logbook of, of a fort that you know long ago was disbanded, you know, it fit very nicely in there. And, and so perhaps in terms of the argument, the value may have weighed on one side, but the fact that it so clearly fit into our holdings, that made it to us something that we needed to talk to at least the holder of it. And then now kind of on the other side of it is, is what Mitch will talk about. Right, and, and I, just to ask you one more question, because it leads into this story, is in during your career, had, and Nara, how many times have you brought or asked DOJ to come on board and help with it uh, with the case? I don't think I've done it five times. Okay. Well, this uh, is one instance where you did. Uh, Abraham Lincoln signed a lot of documents during the war. He was also incredibly sympathetic to the soldiers who served in the Union Army. And there were a number of instances where soldiers found themselves in trouble. And in the case of uh, Private uh, Adam Laws, who was um, a member of one of the United States Color Troop regiments, Laws had been um, on duty and he fell asleep, which is against not only uh, Army protocol, but it is sentenced to death. And he was court-martialed and his case came to President Lincoln like all of the, the cases where um, the death sentence is being considered. And Lincoln weighed in on this case like he did on all the others. And he basically exonerated uh, Adam Laws. And there are numerous other instances of records at, at NARA that um, exemplify uh, Lincoln's, um, basically his generosity in terms of understanding. The Washington Post ran an article about a collection of Lincoln items that had been found in a house outside of Washington. And the story goes is the person that found them had a business where they would go to your house when uh, you were moving your grandmother out or a family relative. And this person would go through and help you um, either discard things or perhaps if there was something that had some intrinsic value, help you sell them. Well, this person found a whole bunch of Lincoln items, including the document that's on the screen that not only has President Lincoln's signature, but it also has that of Senator Charles Sumner from Massachusetts, who was a Republican and anti-slavery. So the Washington Post does an article on this and it comes to our attention. There were a number of items in this collection, but this particular item, which as you can see, is a strip of paper with endorsements from Lincoln and Sumner that appears to have been cut out and then mounted on another piece of paper. And the paper itself, is pretty old. So we knew that this had been done a long time ago, most likely before NARA was created in 1934. But it interests us, it interests the agency. And we decided this is something we want to look into. And I'll let Jeff take the story from here. So so when Mitch brought it to, brought it to my attention and we were working together, we, as Mitch mentioned in the very beginning, we start working with the subject matter experts. Um, and, and initially we, we, we kind of thought that that was an original, it was something that should have been with us, but we didn't know exactly where it came, where it came from. So you know, we had done some initial looking and we thought it came from, from one subset of a, of a record group. And when, that's when we started, I think we first did contact the person who held, who held the record. And the person who held the record um, was not very interested in, in working with us. And I understood it. We can understand it because uh, her interest was in selling it. And, you know, it would have, it would have fetched a pretty good amount of money. Um, so as we were thinking about how we were going to approach this and, 
you know, try to make it as sweet a deal. We won't pay, we cannot pay for items, but we can offer a tour. We can try to, um, to give kind of a big thank you uh, to anyone who would, who would help us on something like this. We also spoke more, and Mitch really did most of the speaking to the subject matter experts to say, let's really look more closely. Where exactly did this come from? And, and the subject matter experts started digging into it and I think Mitch knows exactly how. Uh, sure, let's yeah. go to the next slide, please. Um, the one thing that Jeff didn't say is that the owner of it had already saw dollar signs and consigned it to a dealer. So not only did Jeff have to talk to the owner of the document, but also um, the autograph dealer, who I think was pretty cooperative, understood the situation, but their hands were tied because they did not own the document. They simply were being the seller and it was on consignment. The initial place that we thought would be the most obvious of where this came from were the court martial files of the army, which NARA has a large collection. We searched through every page. I dragged uh, Jeff into the stacks. We opened the box, we opened the folder for Adam Laws and it was pretty, and we saw other Lincoln uh, signatures in there. But this sort of thing just did not stand out. So I dragged out of retirement our Civil War specialist. And he came in and we set him loose in another stack. And he said, I'm going to check the United States Color Troop records to see if this had been advanced. And sure enough, um, our specialist found what you see in front of you on the screen in a folder, the, the record to the left identified as laws. And then inside, he found what would be the Willy Wonka golden ticket. He found the document where this item had been cut from. Not only that, but the uh, card to the left where it says that a clerk had actually looked for this, I believe it's in 1903, and noticed that the item had already been cut out. So what that told us was, this document had been in government custody. And that gave us the impetus to go after it. But the kind of tricky part that I'll let Jeff talk a little bit more about is this occurred before the founding of the National Archives. And whether or not that um, either helped our case or did it kind of diminish things? I don't know that I, I don't know that it that it hurt it hurt it because there is some case law you know that that talks about you know government ownership of the records and as I said you know there's our statute and there's also the Constitution that talks about the proper disposal of property and you know that certainly reaches back you know right from the beginning so so that that helps us but I think in many ways what really helps us is is that we can show exactly where it came from exactly where it fit. We could trace it back so that if you're forced to actually go to court, you don't have any gaps. You don't have any gaps in, 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 in the facts, knowing how things happened. And, and that's ultimately what we had to do because the, the holder of, of the record, even when we pointed this out and said, but still we will you know, uh, you know, try to help you as much as you can, you know, um, we're not, you know, we're, we're not, again, we're not looking to make anyone uncomfortable. Um, but, um, but she was, was, um, was not willing to work with us on this. And ultimately we went to the Department of Justice and we made the case that this was something that was, was of great continuing value, um, was clearly um, in the custody you know, of the government and was improperly alienated. And we filed a replevin case. And the, um, the, once we filed the replevin case, uh, what, uh, what the holder did was was uh, essentially essentially uh, admitted that she held it, but under protest. So there was really no no substantive argument that she made, and the court found it very easy to rule that we had title to it and that it should be returned. Right, and um, one thing I like to add is when Jeff and I ultimately we do this together, make that uncomfortable phone call to somebody to say, hey. We think you have a federal document and we've done our homework and we feel pretty strongly that it belongs 
with the National Archives because we've been entrusted with the records where that particular item belongs to. The first question they always ask is, okay, how much are you gonna pay me for it? And that comes up frequently. And we never pay for a document. We don't now, have the authority. We don't have the authority. The only time that we might pay for something is through our um, presidential libraries and through their, yeah, where they have money. If it's something that's not a federal document, like perhaps a president's high school um, yearbook, something that they feel is, um, you know, worthy of us having. Otherwise, we will never, never pay for a federal document. And and even in those cases, again, it comes to us through a donation. It's yeah. not it's not yeah. payment using federal funds. Right. And um, the donation process is that uh, Jeff will help them in terms of getting some sort of write off through the IRS, but it's up to the owner of the document to get the appraisal. We cannot say to them, well, we think your document's worth $10,000, $7,500. That's completely up to them. We step aside. Uh, let's go to the next slide and talk about another case that, that Jeff and I worked really hard at. And it's interesting. And again, money became the issue. Actually, why don't you talk, because there was a note about this case I wanted to to double check. Okay. This is the Surgeon General case, right? Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. So <laughs> again, we get notified by various people that there are federal documents for sale. But I also spend part of my day looking through catalogs uh, online, some of them paper. And this happened to be one that um, I noticed. And the real clue to me was in the middle there, in that red writing, is a file citation, but also a Roman numeral. And having some experience with the military uh, agency records held by the archives, I had a pretty good idea of where to look. And if you know how the process worked during the Civil War within the Union Army, Lincoln pretty much had to approve any high level appointment of a general officer, or in this case, the Surgeon General of the Army. And it would go through the Secretary of War who would send it for Lincoln to give some sort of endorsement. Uh, one of the uh, tools that we use, especially for Lincoln, is Roy Basler's collected works of Abraham Lincoln. Back in the 50s, Basler and researchers came through the archives and looked at numerous records and made uh, documentation on them that's now bound and also online. The Adam Laws uh, record was not within Basler, nor was this one. But I went into the box where these records are held, found the actual case file based on the number there in the middle of the envelope and saw that it was a huge file, but it also had a number of appendixes, appendices. And they were all in Roman numeral and it was something to the effect of there were eight or nine of them. We had all of them except for this number and they were documented and it was, as they say in basketball terms, it was a slam dunk. It, it was, and, and I remember you know, we, have, we have a letter which we will send to people. Um, there's a certain format to it. it. It sets forth the statutory authority, how we are organized and that we don't do this very often, but occasionally we find something that's very, valuable just like this and it was one of the longer letters we had to write because we had to explain it, exactly how Mitch was talking about how everything was was listed and how it fit in and and as I recall the um the uh, uh the wasn't so much the owner but it was uh, the dealer the dealer was was really putting us through our paces you know to to really show that we had you know we had every and we had every I dotted and every T crossed and, and we were able to do it in this instance, but it did take us, it took us a while, it took us a while before we actually got the document back. Yeah, and again, it came down to money because the dealer who dealt in, you know, mostly stamps, envelopes, franked envelopes, things like that, was afraid to go to the owner who had put this up um, on consignment because they were selling it for something in the neighborhood of like 15,000, uh, might have even been a little bit more. And 
this person who put it up on consignment was a, a huge client of the dealer and essentially did not want to irk them and prevent them from consigning um, other items. And their argument, and it's a question again that comes up to us all the time is, okay, this clearly um, was signed by Abraham Lincoln back in 1864. You can't tell us when it was removed from government custody. And we have information that this item had been sold before. So National Archives, why are you contacting us now? Well, because we just heard about it. Um, <laughs> it's as simple as that. Ways, it's, that it's, simple. it's as simple as that. And that question, along with how much are you going to pay us, comes up frequently. And, you know, there are often we don't hear about items until they make some noise. And there is really, unless it's a theft, there is no statute of limitation of when we're going to go after something. I, I think that's right. I, I also think that, you know, we really have to think hard right away when we do learn about something. And if we decide at that point not to go, you know, after something, then, you know, we may be, we then would, would face a much more difficult time if it was decided later on that we should have. So, you know, for, you know, Mitch's successor and, you know, my successor, you know, if we were looking through something and we determined for one reason or another that we, that we shouldn't go after it, that could be an issue. On the other hand, if we decide we can't go after it because we, we're, we're lacking certain proof or we can't show the, show the reason why uh, that we really think it belongs to us, but later on that proof emerges or is found, then I would like to think that there would still be the opportunity to, to, to seek a report and action. Yeah, I know we've allotted our time, but I want to say in closing that these are two success stories and, and Jeff and I have many others. Um, we're batting pretty well. I, I'd say we would make the Hall of Fame based on our number, but we have been rejected. We have called people. We have done a little begging, pleading, leather writing, and they've just said no. And then we regrouped, talked to our management, our specialists and recited that maybe this is something for now that we're not gonna go after. Um, the next slide, which is the, the one everybody likes, uh, is the question one. So perhaps, Lisa, do you want to wait till the end when uh, folks can ask questions of all of us? That sounds like a great plan. Okay. So with that said, um, we will uh, step aside and, and uh, listen to others. Okay, I guess it's my turn to come on. I'm Jelaine Chubb, State Archivist at the Tech State Library and Archives Commission. I'm just going to keep my camera off because I'm going to keep looking at some notes and I don't want to keep turning my head for you. So I'm going to talk about recovering rec Texas records through Replevin. Um, and this is actually something that my predecessor, Chris LaPlante, who some of you may have um, remember, um, really started out with COSA talking about Replevin issues years ago and uh, worked with David Howery and others to really focus attention on this. So I'm going to give a shout out to Chris because a lot of what we've done um, under my tenure the last 13 years, um, I learned from Chris and from all the things that he had in place. So let's go to the next slide, if you will. Um, I just wanted to give you the context here. Um, we have some very strong Replevin laws in Texas. Um, and these are the three. Um, obviously, it's, un, it's illegal for government records to be sold or removed. Um, and then Texas Government Code 441.192 um, authorizes TSLAC to recover any state records that are alienated from a state government body. And um, I cite that in every uh, request that I, I put forward um, when we're asking for records back. Um, we also have a local government code, which is, uh, empowers local authorities to do the same. Um, what I want you to know is that TSLAC does not have a dedicated staff division assigned to document recovery. Instead, the replevin-related tasks are distributed among a few individuals. 
I'm the primary person right now, um, but I rely on archivists with subject matter expertise um, often to assist. And while staff occasionally identify a missing or alienated record uh, through our routine searches on eBay or major Texana auction sites like Heritage Auctions, which you may know that name, it's located in Dallas. Um, we most often, it's a case of serendipity. Um, someone's looking to sell or authenticate a document that they've purchased at a flea market, a tag sale, or an antique shop. Uh, and from time to time, a dealer may contact us directly offering to sell an item. Um, and sometimes an astute researcher or a conscientious dealer may send us an email with a link to a document that they saw online or in a catalog and just want us to know about in case um, we're interested. Next slide, please. So these are um, some of the things that we look for when we're trying to identify alienated records. Um, obviously, it's really, it's really great when they have an official stamp on them, but Texas government records um, vary in size and type, just like yours. But there are some characteristics that may indicate that an item is an official Republic of Texas or state document. Uh, most 19th century and many early 20th century documents that were previously owned or that were owned by the state archives have this TX symbol on them. Um, and because a lot of them were stamped. <laughs> um, and that's a pretty easy way to, for us to recognize it. Also, um, we can see a document where it's been cut out, some sort of an embossed or a stamp has been cut from the document. That is a, um, you know, a, a light bulb going on for us. And then we love our red M case stamps that um, designate something as an official uh, Texas Supreme Court document. Um, let's go to the next slide, if you will. Um, we maintain an inventory of Supreme Court case files Republic era documents and maps that we know to be missing from our collection. And we posted these lists on our website. Um, and I have a lot of dealers who look on there first and will contact me when they think that they've seen something that matches. Um, for items that are not on our missing list, such as broadsides, uh, staff, uh, when we come across something, staff are going to consult resources like our original card catalogs, um, publications such as the Bibliography of Texas, Part 1, which has our Texas imprints, or our public printing papers, which substantiates that an item, um, all of these can substantiate that an item was once in TSLAC's collection. Um, we, again, we have these posted and available online. Okay, next slide. Um, we also have a really wonderful tool. And again, a shout out to Chris. Uh, they started the, uh, back in the early 2000s, developing a Replevin manual. This is something that I and our staff use uh, to guide us through our Replevin work. And you can see I've posted the table of contents. Uh, we talked about auction sites, how we review the catalogs, um, what we're looking for in terms of Republic era documents and the search strategies that we might have to look at, which, which resources are we going to, to refer to. Um, the Supreme Court case files is a distinct uh, series that we know over a thousand case files were stolen from the Texas Supreme Court by a porter in the 1970s. And that case is well documented. Um, he actually went to jail, but we are still recovering those today. Broadsides, um, and it gets down into our recovery steps, you know, step by step. Um, how do we approach 
working with a dealer? How do we make our demand letters? Um, you know, when are we going to contact the office of the attorney general? Um, and then also into once we've gotten the document back, what do we need to do to accession a file appendices to um, to our collections, to our finding aids and things like that? Um, and then we've got um, a couple of we, we've got a number of, I guess, templates, if you will, of all of these items, everything from our Replevin handout a donor acknowledgement letter, um, our initial um, letter of request or demand letter and those types of things. Let's see, um, let's go to the next slide. And um, so the first thing that we do once we, we've gotten the, or have determined that it is a state record and we do want to go out it. The next thing we do is to prepare a detailed replevin report. And this is um, an example of a couple of pages of just one report. And I think this report was about 13 pages long. Um, this is going to compile all of our descriptive information on the item in question, um, both from the auction catalog and any websites where it's appeared. Um, we're going to download any photographs of the item, note the contact information of the sellers, just as much information about the item up for sale um, as possible. And then we're going to lay out all of our evidence on why that record is a state record. Um, some entries are going to be brief. Other reports can be very lengthy. As I mentioned, this was 13 pages. Um, but once we have a clear and convincing argument, we're going to consult our legal counsel, and we're uh, fortunate now to have an attorney on staff that we can work with. Um, but we also may have to call in the Office of the Attorney General. Um, and I'm also going to talk to my boss, the agency director, um, and proceed with getting authorization to issue a demand letter. Next slide. And in the initial demand letter, these are all the elements that we're going to make sure that we include. Um, we always contact the seller in hold, um, or the holder of the item in writing. Um, the initial and subsequent correspondence is going to entail providing that proof that the item is the property of the estate, and we try to give as much detail as we can. Um, and just like NARA, TSLAC is not going to purchase or reimburse uh, individuals for the return of items that are rightfully state property, but we try to make the return um, as amicable as possible. Um, we're routinely advising them that they may claim the return as a tax deductible gift to the agency, but that for items valued at 5000 or more, they're going to... Um, need to get that certified appraisal. Next slide, please. So here's just, um, I, I took off the salutation and the inform, um, but here's just a very brief um, demand letter that we have. And you can see that it asserts our claim of legal ownership for the item. I'm citing our Texas government code. I'm citing where we found this item through Heritage Auctions catalog um, and the lot number and where it's missing from, again, from our collection of old comptroller's correspondence of 1836, the description um, that the fact that the item is actually included on our missing list and I give them the link. Um, I have also attached copies of both um, uh, the, I think of the item and of, of our missing page or the, the page that we have where it shows the item is missing. Um, it's also identified in the collections of the state library in a really wonderful resource, the papers of the Texas revolution that says it was here with us at least in 1973. And I demand that they remove the document from auction 
and notify us of the name and contact information for the person offering the document for sale. And that if this document is currently in the possession of Heritage Auctions, it should not be released during the pendency of the claim. And that is very significant. That's how we work with, um, you know, with, with any of the auction houses. We want them to hold that item and not release it back to the seller if they're in possession of it. Okay, next slide, please. And um, I think you're gonna see, yes. Um, for contacting the uh, eBay dealers, um, you know, eBay says you're violating its rules if you provide a website link or um, specific information like telephone numbers. And uh, so I've developed a way of contacting the seller through, um, you know, just by sending them a, oh, you've got a question about this item? Yes, as a matter of fact, it's come to my attention that this item is something that belongs to us. And I'm gonna give some of the same information I spoke of earlier. Um, I also kind of will include a little information in here so that they know we're not attacking them and accusing them of theft. We're giving um, some background on how this item may have left uh, state custody and giving them a link to um, where they can find more information about that. And then I ask them to contact us and they can contact me through eBay or um, this one of the, um, the website has our contact information on it. So it's a little bit of a way to get around eBay and their, their um, sticky requirements. Next slide, please. Um, and I am happy to say that since 2010, when I came on board, we've recovered nearly 200 documents through Replevin efforts. Um, over 170 of those are Texas Supreme Court case files that date from the antebellum period. And our largest recovery was 73 I, um, case files that was held by a dealer out of state. I believe it was r, &R Auctions. Um, and that was in 2011. Um, but I will say that most of our recovery is done through um, through eBay or um, local Texas um, auction houses like like Heritage Auctions. Um, we have rarely had to go out and initiate legal action, um, but we're not opposed to it, as you'll see. Um, most reputable dealers and conscientious individuals are willing to return the requested items once um, they examine the state's evidence of ownership. In other instances, um, we've had to call on local resources. Um, in one instance, out of state, I actually had to call on a colleague, Kathleen Rowe, from the New York State Archives to go and visit a gentleman and convince him that, yes, it was a Texas document, and please return it to us. And that was very helpful. Um, go to the next slide, please. Um, there are a number of things we consider um, whether or not to pursue legal action and to get the assistance of the Attorney General's office for more complex situations. Um, you know, was there a non response to our demand letter? Um, are there disputes over the provenance or the ownership? Um, sometimes the certified letter from the OAG will um, convince um, a reluctant seller to cooperate with the agency, but when that's not the case, a visit by an investigator or the threat of legal action has proven useful. Next slide. Um, the most recently settled court cases that we had were in 2004 and 2008. Um, and while TSLAC prevails in most cases, in other instances, the agency has elected to negotiate an out-of-court settlement. Um, the last time that occurred was in 2006 
for a tremendously large cache of records from the Texas legation um, that, you know, date to when Texas was its own nation. Um, we currently have a case pending in Travis County District Court, and I can talk more about that in the Q&A. Um, but, you know, for the most part, uh, we've had our, our luck with just asking nicely, but firmly. Um, next slide, please. And I wanna close by sharing another tool that we found particularly helpful. Um, it's a spreadsheet that we use to track all of our replevant efforts. It's a quick way for us to see how recovery has progressed and to also get some useful metrics. Um, you know, we've got, you know, wh what is the item? Where did it come from? Um, what's the date on it? Uh, who's the seller? Um, when did we recover it? Uh, did we accession it? And then any notes about um, the the correspondence and the um, actions that we've taken to to uh, get this item back. Okay, let, next slide, last slide, and just our work continues. We've got lots of information online about how others can help us cut recover missing Texas history, um, and we also like to. Um, uh, broadcast our successes from time to time, um, like we did with the, the return of the legation records. Um, and we also keep our clippings on any of the documented thefts so that we can turn those over to, you know, um, I guess, uh, reluctant, reluctant holders of these items. So that's Texas. Thanks, Jelaine. So this, my name is Kate McBrien. I think I'm the one up next. I am the Maine State Archivist and my description of Replevin is really much shorter uh, for Maine because we've had one successful case, um, which is great. Um, and we're really quite pleased uh, about it. Uh, but just like Texas, we do, and, and for quite a while, have had a Replevin law within statute, which has allowed us to recover state records uh, Maine's just been very hesitant to actually enforce that law um, until uh, just last year. We found a perfect case, um, and it was it was really worth the try. Um, so the next slide, please. In October of last year, a scholar at the University of Maine uh, notified the state archives about an 1839 letter that was coming up for auction. Uh, the letter was written by um, Governor John Etienne and Lieutenant Governor John Neptune of the Penobscot Nation, uh, an indigenous community within the area now called Maine. And it was written to the Maine state governor, John Fairfield. Um, and so with that, when, once we learned about the letter, um, we found that it was actually very significant because it was written from the indigenous perspective. In it, the Penobscot leaders described how their community assisted colonists, how they adopted European customs, and how they sought to help their neighbors. And within the letter, the purpose of the letter was that they were requesting $100 from a trust fund that was held by the state of Maine for the Penobscot Nation. They needed the money to recover silver brooches that had been pawned uh, to pay for travel to Montreal, Canada. One powerful line from the letter uh, is this, I'll read you a quote. It said, by sending us the money, you will make us sure that you are a friend of the Indian. White man and Indian, all children of our father, God gives us different color, but God makes our hearts alike. So they were really trying to appeal to the emotions and the, and the sense of duty that the state of Maine had for holding this trust um, and asking for the funds to recover their silver brooches. Uh, next slide, please. So how do we know, just like NARA, just like Texas, how do we know that this was actually a state document? You know, this was written in 1839. The state archives wasn't established until 1965. But our law actually says that any document that was used uh, within state business, either received by or created by state government within state business, no matter what the date was, um, that it was still a state record. 
And we were able to confirm that this was actually received by state government, um, partially because of the outside of the letter. This was sent in, as a folded up document addressed to the Honorable John Fairfield, Governor of Maine. And you can see at the bottom of the picture in the brown ink or uh, little notes those were actually the um, names of the people who sent the letter, but this was the state's system of indexing records at the time. They would fold them up, they would write either the subject of the letter or the sender of the letter and file them um, in a box or in a drawer. Um, and that's how we know that it was actually received, it was processed. We also know from one other way, even though this letter had not been in the possession of um, the state archives, what was in the possession of the state archives uh, was the state's response. Through our executive council records, we had the executive council's decision to this letter, to this request, in which the state denied the request. They said that it wasn't worth, um, that their reason um, was not worthy of the trust fund, and so they would not give them uh, the funds. So we know that this letter had been received, it had been considered, the state had actually made a decision in response. Next slide. So we were able to recover this, le this letter um, because both the definition of a state record in our statute, um, as well as our Replevin law um, really fit quite nicely. This law specifically states that the identification of a state record is based on the assessment of the state archivist. So that's me. The law spells out just like Texas, just like NARA, you know, it sets very good regulations and, and criteria around what the um, notice, written notice and demand um, has to state, what information it should include, how it should be sent and how it should be received. Um, and then like most other states, it also specifically states that the sale or transfer of a state record is prohibited. It's a class D crime in Maine. Next slide. And so with all of this, I was actually able to work pretty quickly to recover this letter from uh, the auction house where it was being sold. We were notified of the letter uh, on October 12th. Um, uh, an archives, uh, archivist colleague of mine received the, the message and passed it on to me and said, this might be pretty important. We should check it out. Um, so we did. Uh, I went and visited the auction house in person. Didn't tell them exactly why I was there right away until I could figure out more. Uh, but I did view the document just to verify its authenticity, uh, that it was actually from 1839, that this looked to be um, an authentic document and that it had indeed been received by state government. With that, I worked with, with our attorney general's office to issue um, the letter, which is a notice and demand for return. Um, just like everyone else it spelled out the statute that we referred to, um, what was the process that the auction house needed to notify the actual owner and seller of the letter and that they could not um, pass it on in any way um, now that they had received this notice. Uh, and within just a couple of days, I was able to go pick up the letter from the auction house. Everyone responded very quickly and said they had no idea that the law even existed. Both the uh, auctioneer and the owner of the letter were surprised, um, but immediately said, well, if the law is the law, and so they turned it right over. So we were able to, within just three weeks, um, find out about this letter for sale and recover it pretty quickly. Last slide. And with that, um, just like in Texas too, we like to celebrate our successes. Um, I was actually really pleased the um, Kennebec Sun Journal, a, a newspaper here in Maine, one of our prominent newspapers, um, took a lot of interest in um, this recovery, um, wrote a lengthy article about it, uh, which became their most widely read article for about three weeks. Uh, and it, for some reason, the article spread across the country. We don't really know why, but Pennsylvania was actually where it was read the most, um, which was great. So, you know, we were able to really sort of spread the word and it made people more aware of the archives and how we're able to save um, their history as well, which was wonderful. And that's it. I'm trying to make it quick because I know we're at four. Thanks, Kate. Um, I'm just going to mention something um, from New Jersey slides and then we're going to jump to Q&A real quickly. Um, Joe has a badge. I wish we all had one. So I just wanted to share that with you. We'll get Joe's stories another time. So we can go ahead and jump right to Q&A now. 
So a quick look at that. David, I'll okay. turn the Q&A over to you. Sorry, I'm trying to actually click my buttons here. Um, st standard afternoon confusion. First, a good question um, for our first contestants, but throw it open generally. Do you consider Replevin to be primarily legal or archival in nature, or is it both? Oh, I mean, I think it's I think it's both. I mean, you have to have that fundamental um, legal frameworks that you can you can say why it's yours, why you think it's yours, but you then need to have the the archival part of it, which is to see just how well it fits into the records, how important it is, does it have continuing value, um, and then you try to use both of those when you're dealing with the people who are holding the record to try to convince them, you know, that there's a that there's a cooperative way to, to deal with it rather than you know find yourself in court. And from the archival standpoint, of course, is trying to tell people that, especially with you know the federal government, these are records of the American people. That's why the National Archives exist. So these records can be shared with anyone who either comes to one of our facilities or uses what records we have that have been digitized and that you know, we're not just, again, the point we made where from the very beginning, we just don't go out and grab things because it looks cool and it's definitely federal and well, we should have it. it again, it's the care and the thought and, you know, as, as our other um, colleagues have said, we lay out the case and archivally say, this is why it belongs in our repository. And then working with the legal aspect, uh, the two of it, You've got a clear cut case, hopefully. Okay. Have a request here um, for Jelaine, particularly. Please share the, can you please share the Replevin manual, maybe in the COSA Resource Center, or is it already there? I do not believe that it is there. And actually, it's under revision because I'm updating some things on it now. So once it is completed, um, I will be happy to to share it. Okay. Also a request uh, for, if, if it's possible to share your slides um, as well as the recording. I know we'll get the recording eventually, but um, um, the I've slides given are in slides. demand. The <laughs> slides, um, Lisa should have my slides. And I actually saw that and I emailed them to Sean already, but All right. for anybody else that wants them, um, Lisa has them. Great. Okay. Now here's a, here, here's a touchy one. Do any of you have concern that by recovering records through Replevin, this may also encourage quiet personal sales of these records in order to avoid attention from folks like us? <laughs> yeah, I think that definitely the answer is yes. Uh, you want to expand? Well, I mean, uh, I think the answer is yes, but um, you know, that's why you have to be judicious about it. I think if you're seen as just grabbing everything you see that arguably you have a claim to, then people are going to react in that way. On the other hand, if you're, um, if you are judicious about it, and you really make the case that this is something that needs to be in a public institution available to, to everyone to look at and to learn from, then I, I don't think that most people are going to, are going to react badly toward you. In, in fact, you're going to wind up getting those calls like Mitch gets, like, like I think some of our other colleagues have mentioned. You're going to get calls from the dealers or other people who say, hey, this looks like something that, that really belongs in a public archives. Um, and if you're seen as the good actor, that's the kind of response I think you're going to, you're going to balance out. And there might be some who are going to kind of secret things away, but you're going to balance it out with the outreach and the goodwill that you gender you know, in the community. Right. And, and what we've learned is you know, by and large, and it's been said already, the dealers are usually cooperative. They don't want to be seen within the community as fencing, selling, you know, potentially stolen items, items that don't belong out in the public. But it's, it's sometimes it's a very tough sell to get these people to, to cooperate because again, money stands in the way. Yeah. Kate, Jelaine, any, 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 any comment from you guys? I think for us in Texas, um, you know, if we see a Supreme Court record, um, 
we're duty bound to request its return. We know that it was stolen. Um, we know that it's part of a larger body of material. And I don't want to be um, in a position where I have to explain why I went after one, but not after another. Okay. Yeah. I mean, oh, gee, this involved Sam Houston, but this involved somebody <laughs> no one had ever heard about. Um, I'm treating them all as state property, the property of Texans. And so we're trying to do our due diligence and, and manage those returns. And, and so that's it. And in Maine, I think we approach it you know, very much the same. If it's very clearly a state record, is going to add so much to our knowledge of the state and our understanding of our history, then it's worth doing. And I think we can make that case to the people who own the record, um, to anyone else who asks about it. You know, I do think um, at least the auctioneers or the dealers who called me up after the newspaper article, they were concerned because they hadn't been aware of the law. So I took it as just an educational opportunity. Like this is a, this is a chance for you to learn. This is the regulations you should be aware of yeah. um, and keep an eye out. You know, if there's something that comes across your desk, let me know. We're happy to help. Okay. In the, in the chat column, there is a, a question from Sean to everyone. Um, have any of you pursued a claim against another historical society or a museum? She's thinking of local organizations here, especially. I smile only because we have not, but I, I've had directors of museums call me up and say, you're not coming after my stuff, are you? <laughs> I have to say no, but I know what you have and that's good. <laughs> as long as you're caring for it and it's accessible, it's a balance. Um, but there are, you know, if there's, if someone suddenly had the original state constitution, the state should probably be holding on to that. So there may be, uh, you know, instances where we'd have to have a conversation, but we haven't gone there yet yeah, we, we have we we've we've talked we did it in a nice way um mm -hmm. we didn't you know we didn't um go overboard and but yeah early on we had to reach out to a a museum and say you know the item that you have on display it's actually a state record and it's part of a case file and we'd like it back and they worked with us they understood um, there's also a, a situation right now where a colleague reached out to me and said, I think we have some records that are probably yours. <laughs> Can I work with you to get them back quietly? And I said, yes, we could. The other is that we could also use this as an opportunity to educate other stewards of materials about the importance of working together to make sure that you know, records are where they should be, and that we can do this in a collegial fashion. So we're negotiating how we might be able to do that, but that that would be a big deal. So it's how you can work together. Yes, our experience is the same. It's it's always been collegial. We we've uh, we recovered from a museum out in Chicago uh, some records related to the prosecution of Al Capone. And, you know, and that worked out, you know, very nicely. You know, we explained, you know, where the records came from that we, you know, have this type of material and this was uh, clearly a gap. And so we were able to, to work it out. And, and also part of that collegiality is saying, you know, if there's, if there's a need or maybe a, a possibility for a joint program, you know, there can be loans, there can be, you know, the, the, the joint program. So, so there's, there's ways to work it out. We did one more recently up in Massachusetts as well. And there have been instances where we've provided digital copies of records. Um, yeah. We've had um, situations where university special collections have had federal documents. And there's so many stories of say federal prosecutors or government officials who I think unknowingly took things home because they thought, well, stuff I worked on, that's certainly the case with the Al Capone, it was a prosecutor's files. And in, in, in those cases, you know, we've had great, as Jeff said, we've had great responses and are able to work uh, 
very closely and get these things back and provide copies if that's something they want. Mm -hmm. Okay. We're down to one last question. Note. Uh, this is actually for Jelaine. Jelaine, if there is an inquiring mind among our listeners who'd like to know more about that pending case in 2021, um, how could they find out more about that? Well, they can go online and look at the court case filings that are in Travis County, Texas. I can give you the citation. It is 03-22. Dash zero zero two seven six dash CV. It is Texas State Library and Archives Commission v. Corey C O R E Y Westmoreland W E S T M O R E L A N D. I can tell you that um, this involves a case or a a document um, from the Republic era. It is um, a letter written in 1836 from the president of the Republic of Texas, David Burnett to Thomas Toby. Um, and you would think, well, it's outgoing correspondence. Yes, but Thomas Toby was an agent for Texas who was working in New Orleans at the time. And this um, is a specifically David Burnett is telling him what to do on behalf of Texas to wow. carry out. And this involves land script, selling <laughs> land in Texas. The other is that um, I'll just tell you that we have multiple other letters from David Burnett to Thomas Toby during this same month on the same subjects. So we're saying, yes, we have a claim to this. Okay. Thank you. Okay, that is the last of the questions, so it's over to Lisa. Enjoy. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, I just want to, at this point, uh, thank everyone for joining us today. Um, watch for other, we have a, next month is the second part of our Building and Remodeling Archives uh, webinar, so I hope you'll join us for that. Um, also, watch for, Sari's probably off for the summer, but they'll have fall webinars coming up. So check out the links to find out what they've got cooking. And as always, there's always ways to contact COSA. We hope you'll reach out. And one last thing that I would like to uh, say, oh, we have a shop talk too, yes. And I hope you'll join us for that. Our major sponsors are allowed to share information with us and this will be coming up June 6th. So with that, uh, lots of ways to contact us and, uh, if you have, and of course we couldn't do any of this without our sponsors. So a shout out to them. And if you have suggestions for future programming, I've put my email in the uh, uh, chat. So please just email me and let me know. The education committee will thank you for suggestions and or your comments. So with that, thank you guys for joining us today. Speakers, presenters, thank you so much for sharing your stories uh, on a topic that I think we could probably listen even longer, but this is our time today. And thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thanks, all. Bye -bye. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>